Tell me about your daughter. Christy and I were really close. She was probably the most fun person that you would ever be around. It was a short life, but she lived significantly in 23 years. Mm -hmm. A Baton Rouge woman is dead after a crash here in New Orleans. Prosecutors say Adams was traveling at, get this, 118 miles an hour when his Lamborghini slammed into that flood wall on Chapatulas. I just hit a curb. Like, I don't feel like going to jail for hitting a curb. In this situation, the individual was above a .08 and he killed someone with his vehicle. Therefore, it falls underneath vehicular homicide, which carries a prison term. We still do not know the actual 100% what happened. No. Okay, I just want to get my turn. So how do I do that? He looked at me and he said, if somebody would have drank that much, or if we would have drank that much, somebody would have died. And all I could think of was, you narcissist son of a bitch. I point blank asked him, tell me who's at fault for this crash. Do you think Christy's at fault for the crash? He said, yeah. Well, that family says they are shocked that Jason Adams is already out of jail. He killed our daughter. He killed her. He used the car to do it, and he served nine months. A man convicted for driving a Lamborghini drunk and killing his female passenger is facing a civil trial. Yeah, we're seven years in, and there's no end in sight. It's not about winning the case. It's about finding the answers. Yeah, and it's our job to get it right. It's the bottom line. They were getting ready to read their verdict. He didn't even show up for the decision. Do you guys have closure? I think closure is closing a book and putting it on the shelf. Right? There's no way in heck I'm turning that last page. Christy Lorette, she's a name probably many are not familiar with. You see, her story wasn't always front page news, and the details of her case are complicated. It's also why her family has been fighting for answers for nearly the past decade. Christy was free-spirited, adventurous, some would even say fearless. She lived life to the fullest. But the Baton Rouge native's life was cut short seven years ago on this stretch of Chapatula Street in New Orleans. How Christy died is no mystery. She was the passenger in a Lamborghini and was killed after the driver of the sports car slammed into a flood wall. The driver survived the crash. What led up to that fateful May night in 2016 is still a mystery all these years later. Questions swirl about that joyride that reached speeds of more than 100 miles per hour. What happened before and during that ride haunts her family till this day. We'll take you inside the trial, the unexpected defense, and for the first time, the video that jurors say was their deciding factor in this case. But we start with what we do know from May 4th, 2016. Tell me about your daughter. Who is your daughter? She was probably the most fun person that you would ever be around. She was very inclusive. It didn't matter who they were. She's the life of a party. And she definitely was the life of the party. I get emotional, obviously, because I still miss her so badly. Christy Lorette had a smile that could light up any room. But on this stretch of Chapatulis, on a relatively cool May night seven years ago, that light would be dimmed. May 4th, 2016 marked a turning point for Diana King and Brett Lorette. Take me back to that day. Take me back to that night. The call you got. I was in Lake Charles at one of my offices there getting ready to hit the road to another office in Lafayette. And it must have been sometime right after around 9 a.m. or so. And Philip called me and said, uh, Christy went to work last night and I've been trying to reach her this morning and I can't. She's not answering my texts, she's not answering my calls, which was totally out of character for her. My first thought was, hey, look, she went to some friend's house, probably had a good time, passed out, they all went to sleep. And then a short time later, he called me back and he said, look, I just heard um, there was a, a car crash in New Orleans and there's an unidentified young lady. When I could tell in his voice that he was, um, you know, he was, he was worried. It wasn't that long afterwards, um, he called me back and uh, 
All they said was, it's her. And at that moment, man, the breath just comes out of you. With the facts slow to come out, the family was finally able to piece together some of what happened that night. After her shift at the now-shuttered Wayfair restaurant and bar on Ferret Street in Uptown New Orleans, Christy took a joyride with friend and New Orleans business owner Jason Adams. But that ride in his Lamborghini came to a tragic end. Police said Adams was drunk when he accelerated past 100 miles per hour, leaving the road in this curve before hitting the flood wall. The speed limit for this area of the Lower Garden District? A mere 30 miles an hour. Once the accident happened, let me backtrack that. Yeah, once, once the, the crash, crash happened, because it was no accident. And we made it a point always to catch ourselves from saying that because an accident is dropping your cell phone, looking down and looking up and hitting somebody in the rear. You know, an accident is not seeing the light turn red or missing the stop sign. But when you gun a high performance car like that and get up into triple digits, that's not an accident. That's a decision that you made. I mean, when you're going 100 miles an hour and you get to that curve, you're done. You got, you're going 50 miles an hour and you get to that curve, you're done. Christy was wearing a seatbelt that night, but still she was no match for the force of the speeding car that hit this concrete barrier wall. Meanwhile, Adams was not wearing a seatbelt. He was ejected from the car with his body tossed several yards away. He did survive, but it's what happened in the hours after the crash that has left the family still with many unanswered questions nearly a decade later. Coming up. Jason was drunk. The blood alcohol that they have on record is much lower than what he actually was. What really happened on Chapatulis? Despite the fact that he had no head injury, despite the fact that the video of him in the hospital shows him perfectly fine and no record of ever losing consciousness seems to magically forget what happened. And the shocking details that left family and friends shaken. I don't have any sympathy for anyone who deals fentanyl. If you're dealing fentanyl, you intend to kill people, and you're going to face the consequences for that. When Louisiana law enforcement needed his help, John Stefanski created the toughest fentanyl penalties in America. That's why law enforcement across Louisiana trusts John Stefanski and supports him for attorney general. We've significantly increased the penalties to where it's one of the most effective and serious penalties on the books in the entire country. John Stefanski for attorney general, defending Louisiana families. My husband was killed by a drunk driver. My daughter was killed by a drunk driver. An impaired driver left me permanently disabled. I needed support, and without MAD, I wouldn't have had that hand to hold me. MAD's been there for me. The common goal is to prevent drunk driving and save lives. Over 13,000 people die per year from impaired driving. That's one every 39 minutes. We need you to join us in the fight to help us end this 100% preventable crime. Between the time of Christy and Jason leaving Wayfair until they hit the concrete barrier going more than 60 miles over the speed limit, little is known about exactly what happened. Meanwhile, Christy's family is left planning a funeral, Adams dealing with the legal repercussions as new questions begin to arise. We had a whole team and we were doing a lot of the investigation that quite frankly, the, the police and the you know, DA couldn't do. Man, we had teams of people getting cell phone records, got all the data from the car, just witness after witness after witness. So we're getting pieces of the story, but never the pieces of the story from Jason Adams. So let's back up. Walk me through the facts that you guys did end up collecting. What actually happened that night? The car collects data from the time a wreck happens and it backs up five seconds. We had a uh, accident reconstructionist go back and show each spot on Chapatula, starting from the crash and working back five seconds. Every spot, so like in front of Walmart, he's traveling 105 miles an hour. In front of the New Orleans Police Department, he's traveling 118 miles an hour. When he hit the wall, he was traveling 96 miles an hour. That's all the, the facts from what his car's saying. Another fact in the case, Adam's blood alcohol content. Remember, Adams was at Wayfair on Ferret Street in New Orleans before the deadly crash on Chapatulas. How did Christy and Jason end up meeting up that night? She was actually that night working as a bartender. After they sat and drank at the bar, the place closed at 11 o'clock. 
he was gonna give her a ride. We had the facts of the receipt from the restaurant to show how many drinks he bought. His story was, I bought those for other people, only had two of them. When he said his drink of choice was Grey Goose and water, and there were 11 of those, but he said he'd only had two of them. We asked him, look at these drinks. And he looked at me and he said, if somebody would have drank that much, or if we would have drank that much, somebody would have died. And all I could think of was, <laughs> you narcissist son of a bitch. <laughs> Police say his BAC was 0.11. That's higher than the legal drinking limit of 0.08. What about his blood alcohol content? Three hours post crash was 0.11 with the legal limit being 0.08. So it was greater than 0.08. But three three hours, hours later. later. And that comes down gradually. Correct. Correct. And so we had, a, we hired another expert. The expert said that what that means is blood alcohol level at the time of the crash was 0.16, which is double. double. We can just speculate, right? Right. But here's what Brett thinks. Based on the information we know about him and how he was always in that restaurant acting the way he was, he was trying to impress. And when he gunned that Lamborghini down, Chapatulas, there was no fear factor for him. From here, the details of events gets even murkier. Brett's asked me a bunch. I really want to know why she got in the car. She's not the type of person that would be overly impressed with, with somebody driving a Lamborghini. That's another fact that we'll just never know about why she got in the car, what really happened, or what happened in the car. Because Jason Adams, despite the fact that he had no head injury, despite the fact that the video of him in the hospital shows him perfectly fine, um, and no record of ever losing consciousness seems to magically forget what happened. That's nearly an hour's worth of body cam video of Adams at University Medical Center in New Orleans. For the first time outside of court, you are able to see Adams after that crash. And here's some of the puzzling things he said to police and doctors. I just hit a curve, like, I don't feel like going to jail for hitting a curve. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, like, so I don't know what to do. Okay, well, be, to be honest with you, there may be other factors that were contributing to that. But I think there are other factors besides you hitting a curb. Because there were factors before then. What was your speed? I told you, around 60, 65. You didn't tell me. Oh, I'm sorry. Around 60, 65. Do you know the speed limit on chopper tools? Uh, what is it, 40? No, it's 30. 30. 30. Mm -hmm. So speed. So you were speeding. Yes. After he was read his rights. Hi, Ms. Adams. I'm just going to advise you of your rights and everything. Because I'm going to have to draw some blood. Confused, asking the officer for advice on whether he should sign documents acknowledging he was read his Miranda rights. What, what do you suggest with it? Well, that's the thing. I can't suggest anything. And, you know, I know that's not something that... You, you particularly want to hear, but I, I can't really suggest anything to you. But what I'm asking you to do is just sign it just to say that I read you your rights and everything. That's all that is? That's all that is. It's not an admission of guilt. It's not an admission of guilt at all, sir. But I, I will tell you this, I have to draw blood from him. If I sign? No, not if you sign it. Regardless? Regardless. I have to get blood from him. If you're laying here, what do you do? All I can say is just think about what has happened and, and what's going on and, and think about the young lady's family, that's all. I got all that, so what do I do? Asking for his attorney on multiple occasions. And if you don't mind. Right here. Is that, what does that do? This is basically advising or acknowledging that I read you um, this form here and also advised you of your rights. Okay, I just want to get my attorney here. Okay. So how do I do that? Um, well, right now you're in custody, so... What you want I mean, that's up to you. Mr. Adam. Well, what do you advise? I need to get my attorney. Okay. 
like I said, the only um, the only reason why you're signing this is not to say not to have an admission of guilt, but just to say that I read you this form, which is the form that I just advised you of. As far as okay. And that portion that I added into it is the fatality and the serious bodily injury, um, injury portion is because that applies to you right now. As a fatality? Yes. Yeah. Before joking with nurses. I joined hospital. Me too. And I said because I'm managed doctor, but it's ridiculous. You what? I'm managed physician. Oh, okay. That sounds terrible. <laughs> it is terrible. Prima donna's to the ninth degree. Even laughing as he describes the moments following the crash. At first, I thought it was a motorcycle because. Um, I didn't know where a car was. Yeah, I was ejected like a bomb. How is that? Like, light flashing before your eyes situation? No, seriously. And, but I felt like, so when I landed, I landed on my, like, knees. Mm -hmm. I felt all right. And then I tried to, like, stand up. And uh -huh. I knew my fucking ankle. Oh, your ankle. Up. So then I just stayed on all four. And uh, some guys, like, you need, you need me to call 911. I was like, yeah, please. But when you gun a high performance car like that and get up into triple digits, that's not an accident. That's a decision that you made. But I think once the, the, the crash happened and he survived, then in his mind, he had to start thinking, how, how can I blame somebody else? How can I make this not my fault? I've watched that 50 minutes of video six, seven times. And it angered me he never mentioned Christy's name or her existence or that somebody else was in the car, anything about her for 50 minutes of video. And they're like, he doesn't care. He never did. Next. I point blank asked him, tell me who's at fault for this crash. Do you think Christy's at fault for the crash? He said, yeah, I do. The case heads to trial. They started concocting all these little ideas of what may or may not have happened that caused the wreck. Who was to blame for the crash? Prior to the accident, Christy had reached over. That's the reason why you crashed? That's when we come back. Unfiltered with Kieran. Honored. Winner of two Edward R. Murrow Awards, including breaking news. This is the scene. This is all started around 10 p.m. last night. And our series of investigations. There was never any attempt to deceive that led to change impacting all of Baton Rouge. The transparency is not there. The trust between the public and public officials is not there. Unfiltered with Kieran, committed to bringing you the award-winning local news that you deserve, Unfiltered. My name is Tess Rowland. My name is Michelle Ramsey. Donna Davila. Jeff Kidlasic. I was hit head on by a suspected drunk driver. And an impaired driver killed my four-year-old son and my six-year-old son killed my daughter and unborn granddaughter. Left me permanently disabled at the age of 23. If you or a loved one has been hurt or killed by a drunk or drug driver, please call our 24-7 helpline at 1-877-623-3435. With the facts of the case starting to come to light, the legal ramifications begin to play out. And it all started with a phone call to an old friend. I haven't been in motion about this case since the trial, but I knew I would stay. <laughs> Stephen DeBosier of the Dudley DeBosier Injury Lawyers in Baton Rouge is good friends with Christie's father, Brett. I didn't want to be involved in the case because of our relationship, but uh, like two days after the funeral, he said, hey, I need help. This case was personal. Yes, this case is personal. Why? I made mistakes in my life. 
I'm assuming you have. Uh, but yeah, to, to make such a horrific mistake and then just thumb your nose at the people that you you hurt just sucks, man. And so, yeah, it, it's very personal. Now walk me through the case. It was, it's very frustrating when you're dealing with the, the civil side of being these cases because there's the criminal side first. So we're hamstrung in the sense that we, it's, the family wants information. They just want to know what happened. And so I had to sit here and tell them, hey, it's going to be years. What was the outcome of the criminal proceedings? <clears throat> that was um, disheartening. The family would go to every hearing, everyone. 41 times they showed up to watch Jason Adams walk by him, you know, looking like he didn't care. His lawyers fighting whether or not he was his blood, his lawyers fighting about how drunk he was, his lawyers trying to keep out all the evidence. And his lawyers are doing, you know, what they should do in, in, a, in a criminal matter. But the general public would never realize the harassment that that is for the victims, right? Because they're sitting there watching 41 hearings and so it was just this constant level of frustration for the family to just get answers as to what happened. It's a torture, man. It's an emotional torture that you go through every, every month, sometime every day. You go in thinking, okay, this is, this is what we're gonna do today. But that happens, but then there's 10 more pieces of stuff that Emotions. You didn't you didn't expect or they, they it, it's like they can't explain everything that can happen. The exhausting legal process playing out over years, both sides would get close to a plea deal before it would all fall apart. But five years after the deadly crash, a trial date was finally set before a breakthrough in negotiations. Then he finally pleads guilty to a vehicular homicide, which is driving drunk and killing somebody. The oh. official sentence, if you pull the records, will say he was sentenced to 10, ten years, years. Five years suspended. Five years suspended, five years hard labor, whatever that means, with no possibility of parole. And so we accepted that plea because we knew, based upon all the court law we saw, that was the max that Judge Pittman was gonna give him. We talked about it and said, you know what? We can go through this process and get the same result or we can accept this, this plea as is and be done with it because we were exhausted at that time. We spent 26 months going to 30-something different court dates for him to serve nine months. Yep. He killed our daughter. He killed her. He used a car to do it. And he served nine months. Former New Orleans District Attorney Leon Canizera issued this statement after Adams' release, saying in part, quote, the judge imposed a legal sentence of 10 years with five suspended, which the Department of Corrections has deemed satisfied after just nine months. State legislators have declared this to be the will of the people, but I'm not so sure our citizens fully realize these reforms mean some five-year sentences can be deemed complete after just nine months. Adding, quote, I share the Lorette family's disappointment and empathize for their continued grief. Guilty and now out of jail, the legal team shifts from a criminal defense to a civil defense. We ultimately tried the case in November 2022, and the crash happened in May of 2016. So six years later. And that's six years of agony for that family. And no amount of money is going to bring their daughter back. Oh, no, no. They started concocting all these little ideas of what may or may not have happened that caused the wreck, whether it was him and Christy fighting, him and Christy messing around, whatever the case may be. And so they attempted to bring that up in the criminal trial. But in the civil case, they attempted again to bring it up when he was put on the stand and S Stephen started questioning him on it. He started backtracking. Unfiltered with Kieran has gone through hours of Adam's testimony during his deposition before the civil trial. We will play portions of that testimony so you can hear from Adams in his own words. I might like, just tell us, tell us what happened. As I st stated earlier, I don't recall. Okay. Um, four so you can ask me the next one. I don't recall. I don't recall. And I don't recall. What's the last thing you remember? 
Well, she reached over and grabbed my crotch. Well, how come you never told that story to anybody in the criminal matter? Why, why didn't you bring this up at all? I wouldn't give them the opportunity. I told my lawyers. Well, tell me about that. Did she, how'd she, how'd she grab your crotch? Was she coming on to you? Well, yeah. And so that made you speed up from 50 miles an hour to 118 miles an hour? I don't know what happened. I point blank asked him, tell me who's at fault for this crash. Do you think Christie's at fault for the crash? He said, yeah, I do. Why? But, On what grounds? Because his story was she grabbed my crotch and, and I, I don't remember what happened after that. Prior to the accident, um, an impact, uh, Christie had reached over uh, and grabbed my crotch area unexpectedly. That's the reason why you crashed? You asked me if she's partially to blame. I said yes. And that's what I'm asking you. Do you you're telling What do I feel? Is that what you're asking me? I can't give you a definitive answer. But if you ask me what do I feel is the reason why I crashed? Yeah. I think that played a big part. Not going 118 miles an hour? I think that played a part in that as well. And I, I don't agree that it was 118 miles an hour. It had, did it make you keep accelerating? The acceleration you're talking about in the last five seconds uh, was when she grabbed my crotch and I was not expecting it. Uh, and my foot, I mean, uh, you know, somebody does something unexpected, uh, it is what it is. Um, and, and I would have never gone 120 or 118, whatever you said, uh, around that turn. Uh, was I familiar with it? Yes, enough to know not to go 118, if that's what that's saying. I don't agree with that. Um, but again, even 60, uh, which is where I'm thinking I was at, um, you know, that's about right. I would take that turn at 60 uh, in that car. Because if you ever sat in a Lamborghini or any car like that, you're, you're in a seat where you can't move. It's intended that way so that you're not getting thrown around the car. And she's wearing her seatbelt, according to the crash data reporter, and he's not. It would be very difficult for his version of the story to be true, based on the fact she had her seatbelt on the whole time. There was also the argument about the blood alcohol content. Remember, when blood was drawn three hours after the crash, Jason Adams' BAC was 0.11. Were you aware that the blood alcohol they pulled from your blood showed that it was 0.11? I'm not aware of that. Uh, any conversation we've had about blood's been with my attorney. Um, that's kind of where that's at. And you're certain that the total amount of alcohol you drank was uh, one to two drinks of Grey Goose single and then one shot of Grey Goose on the way out? That I can recall. So no, I'm not certain. Uh, that's why I told you if I was certain, I wouldn't have to say one or two. Uh, I could be certain. No, I'm not certain. Could it have been more? Yeah, but not likely. We hired another expert. The expert said that what that means is blood alcohol level at the time of the crash was 0.16, which is double. double. Originally, the criminal defense lawyers hired an expert, and then the, the civil defense lawyer used that same expert. They didn't tell him about all the drinks he had. They didn't tell him how fast he was going. They, they left out some very important information. And when he was presented with all the facts, he said, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. The expert says, now that I have all this information, he was impaired at the time of the crash. Can you remember when you put Jason on the stand, what his body language said to you? Everything about him was, I can't believe you're putting me through this. I can't believe you're inconveniencing me. I'm blaming me. No, I can't tell you exactly what happened because I don't know. Um, I wish I could. We could put closure for a lot of people. Was he apologetic at all? He kept saying, I, I apologize to the family. And I said, well, tell me what you mean by that. He said, well, I sent them a letter. I said, oh, was it this letter? He said, yeah. And in the letter he sent 10 days after said, my condolences for the loss of your daughter. But at no point did he say, I'm sorry I killed her. 
it, it, it was absolutely, I'm sorry she's not here anymore. I liked her. That was it. And on the witness stand, that's about as far as you got. Was I'm, I'm, I'm sorry she's not here anymore. Did you understand that if you wanted to tell them, you could? I wrote them a letter. And that told them what happened? That told them the majority of what happened. I didn't think I needed to get into details of what happened that night until I was in front of them. Why didn't you want to tell them the details in the letter? Because it wouldn't have done anything except led to more hurt. Um, and at that time, uh, in my opinion, uh, I, there's nothing I could have done. Still today, there's nothing I can do to, to take back what happened. Yeah, but you understand for three years they wanted to know what happened. You understand that, right? I understand that they had the ability to know what happened that night if they really wanted to, uh, whether it was through you uh, or someone else. After a week-long trial, the jury heard all of the evidence and heard from Adams himself. The case would now be in their hands. Think about what, what a jury is processing. I mean, they're listening to somebody say, I know my blood alcohol says this. But that's not true. I don't agree with that at all. I know my own expert that I hired said I was drunk, but that's not true. I just stated I don't think I was impaired. I know my car said I was going that fast, but that's not true. No, I, I don't think it was reckless. This was a traumatic event for me as well. And and so the jury's just listening to this going, I don't, I don't believe you. And then to really seal the deal, this wreck is Chrissy's fault for grabbing my crotch of which no one believed. The verdict, a resounding guilty. 51 million. They awarded $12 million for each of the parents for the loss of their daughter. $2 million for what's called a survival action of what they thought Christy went through in the last moments of her life. And they awarded $25 million to punish Jason Adams for his actions. It, it felt good that other people listened to all the facts and felt exactly how we felt. They did not have an emotional tie to it like we did, but they got to hear all the facts and they agreed. And it became emotional for them too, because they could see who she was and who he was and were like, wow, what a jerk. He needs to be held accountable. The jury thought believed nothing of what he said, and the money supports exactly how they felt. But on the actual day that they had to read the decision of the jury, he wasn't even in court. He didn't even show up yeah. for the decision. That's how much respect he has for my daughter. Coming up, for the first time, the jury speaks. Every day felt like a funeral. What they thought of the evidence. Jason really just like would not acknowledge any of the facts. He said several times that if someone had drank that much, someone would have died. I just wanted to yell at him, someone did. And that $51 million judgment. You guys chose the biggest amount for punishment. Why? Arrogance. Smooth handling and smart interior styling. Just two reasons why the all-new Honda CRV was once again named a car and driver's 10 best trucks and SUV list. Come see your new CRV today at Louisiana's number one Honda dealer. Team Honda on Segan Lane. Hey there, little buddy. What's the matter? What's the matter? My windows, siding, and my door. That's what's the matter. Relief windows can fix all that. I got you. Pop. Gosh, look! Curb appeal. That's a good looking neighborhood. Reliefwindows.com. November 7th, 2022, the family finally gets the justice they fought for for years. When I sat at that table and they were getting ready to read their verdict um, and the award attached to it, like I couldn't even look at them. Like, I didn't know what to expect because we had gotten punched in the mouth so many times. As positive as I could be, I kept thinking, man, they cannot 
not see it the way like I think they should see it. So I just buried my hands in my, my face in my hands and they started rolling with the guilty and the numbers. And at that point, I just thought, God, this is vindication, okay? 12 jurors with a major victory for the Lorette family, and finally some justice for Christy. Jurors awarded $51 million to her family. And for the first time... My name is Char. I was the jury four woman for this case. My name is Alexander. I was juror number seven for this trial. I'm Jill Barber. I was juror number 12. Three jurors are talking not only about their verdict, but what's since become their deep connection to this case. Walk me through the change in your thought process from when you were picked as a juror till the very end after you gave your final verdict. I felt really bad for him in the beginning. He seemed sorrowful when I looked at him the first day, and I didn't see that pretty much after that. First day goes by, I'm okay, yeah, he was sad. And then after that, I didn't really see any more emotion from him. He never apologized for what he had done, or I don't think he verbally even said, I'm sorry. Their decision coming down to a few pieces of evidence, one being the video of Jason Adams at the hospital in the hours following the crash. It was important for us to get the video from the body cam because we wanted to see what Jason was like directly after, how coherent he was, what just his behavior was like. And it was shocking. The nurses were saying again and again that there was a fatality and he was just laughing and joking with yeah. them and saying, oh yeah, I do curb checks a lot. And he laughed. Did a curb, curb check? I did, yeah. Did a string curb check? <laughs> uh, 16 mile an hour curb check. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was something that really struck all of us was just how, it wasn't that he wasn't aware. He knew he didn't care. The total lack of remorse was yeah. unbelievable. And then to compound it with you know, making accusations of how that happened. I was just really disgusted, honestly, because he didn't acknowledge that someone had just died in his car. As a fatality? Yeah. And he just tried to brush over the fact and also that he was laughing. The nurses said multiple times there was a fatality and he would respond with, oh, I should probably get a lawyer then. I need to get my lawyer. He never once asked about Christy, said her name, acknowledged that she was in there. There was no humanity. You know, if you watch this hour long video, nowhere in here does he even acknowledge that there's a fatality. And we watched it all. Another factor, Adam's testimony and his reported disregard of the facts in this case. The something that stuck out to me was how much he disagreed with the facts. Like he kept saying, no, I didn't drink that much, even though it said it on the receipt, even though his expensive car has an exact readout of what the speed was, whether he was applying brakes or gas, he was like, no, the car is wrong. I know I was only going like half that speed. Mm -hmm. And he kept disagreeing with the facts and saying the that arrogance. he was, you know, I know better. I think one of the big ones for me was Jason had said, if we had drank that much, someone would have died. And the fact that he could say that multiple times and not comprehend that someone did die by his hand was so unbelievable to me. Even his finances were scrutinized by the jury. We looked at all of his tax documents, the amount of money that he's spending on houses and the amount of income that he was reporting, it just didn't add up. He was hiding his money. Just all the things that you really can't stand in individuals that are trying to get away with something. So it didn't take me long to figure out there's something wrong with this guy and he's going to do anything he can to win this. We did the math in the four months of that year prior to killing Christy, he had reported $750,000 in losses yeah. for gambling. So that was a big part that went into our calculations is if you can throw away this much yeah. and gambling, what does money mean to you? Ultimately, the jurors reached their decision after only four hours of deliberations. What was your verdict? 
Our verdict was that it was 100% Jason's fault, that Christy had no fault in him drinking too much and driving way too fast. And he needed to feel the sting of, if he wasn't gonna feel it emotionally, maybe he would at least feel it financially. Why 51 million? Arrogance. He thought he could get away with it. And there was a couple of jurors that were really pretty adamant about sending a message. I just yeah. wanted like the message to be big enough so that you know people would be like, oh wow, that's not like a small amount. That's something significant. I can only speak for myself, but I just felt that he, just from his actions, he, he, he just felt so entitled. Will this case stay with you for the rest of your lives? Absolutely. To be able to stand up and be a voice in a way for Christy and hold the person that did this terrible thing to her to some level of account and show him that people do hold him accountable was very rewarding. For Christie's family, and even some of the jurors, there's a connection that was felt immediately after the trial and remains nearly a year later. When we walked out, they were all there. Everybody oh. just busted out crying. Yeah, they hot. were hugging us. They said that they just felt like they knew her. What did that mean for uh -uh. y'all? There was just truly a connection and, and it, I, you know, I say uh -uh. It, was a, it was a short life, but she lived significantly in 23 years and 12 strangers felt it. At times, the trial felt emotional for the jurors as well. Oh, yeah. There were several days I went home sobbing. Every, every day felt like a funeral, every single day. She just had a beautiful, contagious smile. You could tell that she lit up the room. Definitely a free spirit as well. Yeah. yeah. When the verdict was read, the first thing I looked at was just the family. You know, like the people, I know that they were just trying to get answers for years. Just seeing how relieved they were, that really like, you know, I just got them. Do you guys have closure? It's an open wound. Some days are better than others. I don't know why you, people even use closure. You just learned most days to function through it but it's never closure. You wake up on the, the weirdest day at the weirdest time or a, a bird in the yard can send you into tears. I think closure is closing a book and putting it on the shelf, right? There's no way in heck I'm turning that last page and closing that book. It's not happening. So the book's gonna lay open for the rest of my life and we're gonna talk about her and um, my grandson Noah's gonna, <clears throat> gonna know about um, his his aunt and, and what Jason Adams took. If home is where the heart is, a roof is its shield. That's why for nearly 30 years, homeowners have trusted Garcia Roofing. For more information, visit GarciaDidMyRoof.com. He was fired for sexual harassment and assault. Then the Baton Rouge Police Department rehired him 23 years later. How did you find out he was rehired? From you. Unfiltered with Kieran uncovered his history and even spoke with a victim's mother. How did they hire him back? Why did they hire him back? After our series of investigations, Officer Neldair was fired. None of this would have been made public were it not for Unfiltered with Kieran that would have stayed a secret had you not broken the story. Bringing you the news you deserve unfiltered. If you missed this story, watch it now on the Unfiltered with Kieran app. Christie's legacy is so much more than the crash that took her life. It's more than the trials that left so much grief for her family. You see, her family still remembers her as that free spirit who always made sure that everybody around her felt loved 
and appreciated. Chrissy and I were um, really close. I spoke to her or texted her pretty much every day. If my phone rang at two or three o'clock in the morning, I did not even flinch. I knew it was Christy. For Diana King, there was no one quite like her daughter. She was definitely a trendsetter. She wasn't the girl who called everybody to see what they were wearing. She was definitely wearing something that she hoped would stand out. She definitely had to be noticed in the room. And just like Christy, the love between her and her father, limitless. She was smart. I mean, she went to Baton Rouge High. She wasn't scared to try anything. She tried to play sports, I think, because I was a sports fanatic. So she went out for the soccer team and she was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but she was so fast that they would kick the ball to her. She would outrun everybody. But when she'd get to the ball, she had no clue what to do with it. <laughs> and she didn't like sweating. No, she hated sweating. <laughs> the legacy Christy left behind still runs deep for this modern family. Look, Diane and I, it's no secret, we're divorced. Christy's death brought her family back together. Diana and Christy, my wife, are best of friends. Me and Diana are best of friends. Me and Mike, her husband, are best of friends. We hang out together, we do stuff together, and people who don't know think anything look at that and think it's weird. Mm -hmm. And we don't think it's weird at all. I mean, it's just Life. normal. And I think, I, I do believe that Christy looks down on us and that if she, if, she, if she accomplished anything, she accomplished that. Seven years after her death, she's still bringing together her family and even complete strangers. Tell me about the yellow. I think it was her favorite color. We'd wear it in support of her um, in court. We're trying to figure out a way to be, have some solidarity. She wore yellow everywhere. I'm like, well, let's get I mean, our entire team, all the guys on the team had yellow ties. I'm like, man, let's celebrate who Christy was when she was alive. Like that's the first thing I saw, all the yellow in the stands every day. The color yellow became a symbol, one that took a life of its own. We made uh, stickers and buttons that we wore. One of her friends came up with the design because everybody called it Christy Bug. And then the WWKBD was what would Christy Bug do? Um, Meaning live your life to the fullest, enjoy it every single day. People would travel literally all over the world. I get messages on Facebook, hey, can you mail me some stickers? We're gonna be traveling. And so now when I go on vacation, I bring this with me. Because that's what, that's what the family does. Never stopped thinking about her. I have it in my passport book. So wherever I went, you know, that's where she went to. Normally I have mine on my desk. It's in my makeup bag today, but I do take it when I travel as well. If you can say anything to Christy today, what do you say? I love you, sweet pea. I miss you. And I'm extremely proud of you. There are still many unknowns about the night that Christy Lorette died. But one thing that her family hopes you take away from her story is that you don't have to drink and drive. Besides leaning on a sober driver, there are rideshare apps that you can call so you don't have to drive while intoxicated. And if you or someone you know has an alcohol problem, you can call the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. Reporting from New Orleans, Louisiana, from the entire team of Unfiltered with Kieran, we thank you for joining us.